everyone, and welcome to Burning Tech, The Master Speaks. My name is Ramarka Bhattacharya. I'm a fourth year computer science and economics major, and I've been involved with the IOP as a Fellows Ambassador team leader, a career development intern, a member of the Student Advisory Board, and a co-chair of the IOP Tech Team, a group dedicated to civic technology. As someone incredibly interested in both the impact of technology and its intersection with policy, I'm excited to announce two incredibly uh, accomplished journalists, Kara Swisher and Mark Leibovich. Kara Swisher has served as the editor-at-large of the New York Magazine and a CNN contributor, and as the host of On with Kara Swisher and the co-host of the Pivot podcast. Mark Leibovich is a, an Atlantic staff writer and has served as the chief national correspondent of the New York Times Magazine for a decade. Today we'll be discussing Burn Book, a candid and at times caustic assessment of the tech industry and its capricious and sometimes kooky leaders. A few housekeeping notes before we begin. Please turn off or silence your cell phones. When we begin Q&A, please line up behind the microphone. First priority will be given to students. If you're interested in more IOP events, Chicago Style is hosting a short film screening and director Q&A of Cage Dreams in the IOP living room next Friday at 11 a.m. You can also find future events on our website, and you can purchase signed copies of Burn Book in the lobby after the event. Now please give a warm welcome to Kara Swisher and Mark Leibovich. Feels like a gay disco. It is. Was this your walk-up music? Felt like, no, but it's good. I like it. It's very good. I feel like we're getting married. That was unnatural for me. <laughs> anyway. Uh, well, well. Uh, it's a fine place to start. Let, okay. Let, all right, I have a good story. Okay. You don't even know the story, but it's oh. an icebreaker, and it's kind of about tech, so I'm going to tell it anyway, and if it's not funny, all right. just we'll do it quickly. Okay. Because we have temp... Uh, Kara has a heart out. She's got to be out of here at 6. She's being interviewed by Brene Brown somewhere across town. Yes. We are the undercard. So yes. we will be doing this very, very... Uh, what's the word people quickly. use these days? No. Um, uh, uh, intentionally. That's intentionally. a big word today. Okay. Okay. Anyway, my friend, my old pal Jennifer Steinhauer, who used to work with the New York Times, sent me a text and said, hey, you want to come out to Chicago and interview karaoke Swisher? And I figured, now Jen, in addition to being very cool and hilarious, is cool. makes fun nicknames for people. I figured, oh, that's her nickname for Kara Swisher. Really? So I was coming into town uh -huh. and she said, hey, you coming here? I said, no, I'm going to have lunch with karaoke in Chicago. She said, who's karaoke? Is that Kara? I said, yes, you coined the nickname. She goes, no, I didn't. And then she said, and then we realized it was autocorrect. Autocorrect. So she wrote Kara in her wow. thing, and it autocorrected to karaoke. It's and I thought Carrie here she Fisher. was. It's well, usually. Carrie. Well, Carrie. But you know, this was a better auto. Anyway, tech. Great story. Should I have led with it? Maybe not. Um, Damn you, autocorrect. Okay, quickly. I, uh, I am an evangelist both for Kara and her book. I've read it cover to cover. Everyone must read it. Everyone must buy it several times. It is a, an extremely good book, and I loved it. As someone who was a tech reporter about 25 years ago, kind of left the scene and have sort of used Kara as my occasional kind of drop in to see what's going on in that world, even though it's moving at a million miles an hour. But I also am a huge fan of print journalism memoirs. And, you know, now Kara has moved to stage, to podcast, to all number of platforms. But she is at heart a print reporter. Can I say no, that? No, you can't. Okay. Go I ahead. I think of her, I, I first knew print. her as a print. Yes, well, yes, print is dead. We know this. That That's correct. part of the whole yeah. stick. Yes, but so, you can call me. Anyway, it was a great career oh. memoir. I love Thank reading you. journalism memoirs. I love reading memoirs about how people get bored, they seek change. Um, it is one of the key things that people, I think, in this world, even people who try to be ahead of the curve, forget, which is that change keeps you young and vigorous and ambitious, even at our advancing, advancing ages. So I marked up the margins, and now, because we have limited time, I'm just going to go through, go through it. ask go. you a bunch. It's like a lightning round. I asked you some of these at lunch. Yeah. Um, it'll be general. It'll be specific. It'll be the whole thing. Um, one thing that I was struck by in reading about all of these tech billionaires and people who kind of rule our worlds in some weird way, it seems like there is an extremely, what, what is it about wealth and megalomania that breeds victimhood? Victimhood. Okay, so you're talking about what's happening now is we're sort of in the late stages of the beginning of this, of what happened. And it started right. about 25 years ago, I would say, in the, in the mid 1990s, maybe even more, 30 years ago, close to 30 years ago, 
which is a long time. You don't think, you know, there, there was a time before internet, essentially, and that was in the mid-1990s when I first started covering it, uh, around 94, 95, or earlier, actually, 93. Um, and it, 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 there's, a, there's periods of really big hope and startups and the early times, and aren't we special, and this is cool, mm -hmm. and we're like pirates. Um, right. For many years, Apple put the pirate uh, uh, flag above their right. headquarters when they were hundreds, millions of dollars they each had, which was kind of, I always laughed. I'm like, you're not pirates. They're like, we're pirates. I'm like, you aren't mm -hmm. pirates. I mean, you, and we would argue about this because mm -hmm. you have an idea in Amber what you were before what you became in a lot mm -hmm. of things. And tech, more than anyone, likes to cosplay that they are innocent and that mm -hmm. they are good and that they're here to save the world 100%. and that they're the heroes of the story largely because they're, they're very into video games. I know that sounds crazy, mm -hmm. but one of the smart things, Ben Meserick, I interviewed him recently, he did the social network and the anti-social network, mm -hmm. which Dumb Money was based on, and mm -hmm. the social network, obviously, what the Facebook movie was based on. Um, and he said they all think they're ready player one in a video game, mm -hmm. and the rest of us are fungible. Mm -hmm. And I thought, oh, absolutely, that is mm -hmm. what has happened here. They started off as heroes, they went through a number of uh, tasks, myth mythological, I guess, if they read mythology, which they don't, um, but video, in a video game sense. And then mm -hmm. they, they've turned into the villains they were fighting, and, mm -hmm. except they can't see themselves that way. And so right. instead of thinking of themselves as potentially villainous for some of the things they were doing, they think of themselves as victims and that we question them. Right they get angry and so they're aggrieved. And so I call it the, the grievance industrial Definitely. complex. Um, and and they're, I've never seen the richest and most powerful people in the world act like victims and whine about it like endlessly. I mean, because my, my world now is politics yeah. and I think a lot about this. And, and in some ways, well, why are alpha, alphas always the biggest victims? I think Donald Trump. I think Elon Musk. Well, he's Musk. a unique individual. Well, no, but, I, but I, don't, I think there's some real crossover between him and Elon 100%. Musk. Bill Gates, when he was the victim during the antitrust stuff. Bill mm -hmm. Clinton did a whole lot of victimhood yes. during his administration, during his political career. Yeah. Um, it does seem to go hand in hand in ways that you seem to Well, it also has one thing in common, a certain cr level of chromosomes. Um, but um, it's a good, uh, we're going to get to that. Pointing it out. I yeah. have three sons, so I mm -hmm. can say that, apparently. Um, but I, I don't know. It's a really big thing. is because they, uh, they imagine themselves heroes. I'm telling yeah. you, this is what they think they are. And, you know, Elon is probably the best example of that. He's sort mm -hmm. of curdled into this figure that he, mm -hmm. and he doesn't see himself and his followers don't see him like that. The same thing with Trump, he's curdling into right. himself um, and he's a cartoon version of his original self, which was already cartoonish to start with. Mm -hmm. And so I think what happens is as you get immensely wealthy, your world gets smaller and smaller. Mm -hmm. They really do. They go from car to plane to beautiful campus to this, to Fiji, to the yacht, they really do move mm -hmm. like this. And you know, I did that also, besides doing the podcast I do, I did the Succession podcast. Mm -hmm. And I urge you to go see the last episode of that, where they are, they, they, the, the winners are in a, in a sealed, go from a sealed headquarters to a sealed uh, area downstairs, mm -hmm. holding pit area, to, um, to the car, and they're the right. winners. The only per and the one person's by themselves with and with a with a guard essentially mm -hmm. uh, by the water, but so solitary. And the other, the only person who gets out is Roman. He's in a bar mm -hmm. with people. Mm -hmm. These people are not with people. I, I, and it is a little like politics, the hermetically sealed. Except it's a lot less. You know, with politics, you're in a best western. Yeah. Um, but it's 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 a similar thing. And then you have people who are around you that benefit from you almost persistently. And so they're going to say, mm -hmm. my, Mark, what a giant head you have. How smart you must be. I actually and, do have a giant head. People okay, have I'm sorry I said that. that. No, no, but, it's fine. I, I, um, I totally own it. But, but no, they hilarious. do. They have people violently agreeing with them. And then if mm -hmm. you give any kind of pushback, um, any of them, when I give slight pushback, they think mm -hmm. you're attacking me. Oh, yeah. And, well, and, and, and no one told me that. I'm like, well, everyone gets paid by you. So of course they're not going to. It's like a court. Yeah. It's a kingship. And so... It's, it's kind of classic, right? I mean, it is and it isn't, except that it's also so, yes, classic, predictable, and utterly destructive to much of like our way Correct, of life. And so these are deeply have, powerful people. Because they have, oh, God, it's Scott Galloway calling. Anyway. Oh, um, she's checking her watch. No, it just, he just oh, okay. literally, of yeah, course, yeah, yeah. calls right now. I'm not going to ask you about him. You told me not. Okay, all right. Yeah, yeah. 
Um, okay, I'm, one of the things that your book is really interesting about is the pursuit of happiness, mm -hmm. both your own happiness as you go through life and also the nature of happiness among people who accomplish insane amounts of wealth and building companies and mm -hmm. you know, legitimate technological um, stuff. <sighs> What, what do you think the nature, I mean, let's talk about, let's do, let's do how we did it earlier, which is if you were to take a random 100 people who have more than $100 million mm -hmm. and a random 100 people who have, let's say, $2 million, mm -hmm. what sampling do you think would be happier? Well, you know, there's lots of studies on this, as we talked about, that there is a certain amount of money after which you're unhappy or you're mm -hmm. not, it only takes a certain, it's a lot smaller than you think. Right. Um, because what happens is you get into great, um, Choice is always a problem for people. Mm -hmm. if there's too much choice, unhappiness for There's study after study after study. And so what's happening here is much different because the level of wealth mm -hmm. is so obscene. Right. It really, and I hate to say that because, and the reason I started the book off, the, the first line of the book is critical to understand, mm -hmm. which is, so it was capitalism after all. Yeah. It's always capitalism, but these people don't think they're capitalists. They're, they mm -hmm. think they're something special, and in some cases, gods. Right. And the people they revere are are like that, they right. think they're that. And so it, 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 it has a deleterious effect on almost everybody, but mm -hmm. not everybody, right? Mm -hmm. I, you know, Tim Cook still has a pretty simple life. He goes and works mm -hmm. out, he talks about Auburn football, mm -hmm. he eats like very little carbs. You know, he has a very, he does, it's having lunch with him is exhausting because <laughs> they, they, they bring you the most perfect piece of chicken with just a piece of lettuce and then a sprinkling of quinoa, just like, a, like that, like they went. <laughs> And, and it's, the food is so funny with these people. Um, but, um, and their food habits, they're, anyway, they're, it's just weird. Um, and now they just take a Zempic. Save it for Brene like, Brown. Yeah, okay, they yeah. just take a Zempic yeah. now, and that's what they're doing now yeah. after all of that bullshit they pulled. Um, but you know, they, it has a deleterious effect on them and their mentality, again, because they surround themselves with people mm -hmm. and in, in, in its concentric circles. And it is not unlike politics except the stakes are, have much more money involved. Right. And therefore, they think they're experts on things, like mm -hmm. venture capitalists giving, giving tips on Ukraine. Mm -hmm. I think we could all sit, sit down, boys, yeah. is what I always say. Sit down, the Bill other day, Ackman. Elon mm -hmm. was talking about cesareans and his thoughts on them. <laughs> and I was, like, I was like, hey, had one. Don't want to hear from you, for sure, like about head size. And it was, you know, like he was, the, he was an expert. Go on. Well, I almost mm -hmm. found yeah. him. He's not yeah. speaking to me, but I almost found him and uh, showed him my scar. Like, you don't get to talk about this, or you can, but not publicly. Head size, Head recurring size. motif. About brilliance yeah. and this and that, whatever he was talking about. Yeah. So, you know, they, all, they, 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 have, they move into areas of which they don't have any expertise on, and that's oh, what's yeah. fascinating. Right. That's what they're doing now, and they're actually having impact, like Elon with Crimea right. deciding to geofence an area. Right, I saw that. What? Yeah. Uh, that, that, when that happened to me, I was in a, the French embassy, and the, um, um, this guy comes up to me, and he's like, hello, I'm from Ukraine. And I'm like, oh, hi, nice to see you. Hope you're doing OK. And he's like, we need your help. We need Elon to not geofence Crimea. And I was like, what? Like, it was me. It was Kara Swisher. I was wearing sneakers. I was like, oh. It was just like some party at the I felt like embassy. I was in Homeland, except for idiots. Like, it was weird. <laughs> Wait, but was it a party? It was a party. Yeah. And they're like, you know him. You can convince him to not geofence. And I was like, why is he deciding? Like, He's like, not wrong. Well, I, fine. I mean, not that you could influence him, but it's, an, I mean, it it's not weird. a long way from point A to point B here. Well, I get it, but it was sort of like, why it, is the government weird. doing this? No he question. should be a government contractor, and elected officials should be making these decisions. And right. why is some single person in charge of that was disturbing to me on every Absolutely. level largely because I know him like yeah. you know and I look there's been contractors forever they've had to keep their eyes on them forever but mm -hmm. this was a singular person and you know if he goes sideways which he's clearly, sideways he's, it, he's way here. past sideways uh, uh, so it that's that was what it was and so they have immense power including over our politics over our social lives, over everything. Well, if you think about yeah. Musk by himself, between the cars and the space and the satellites and the Twitter. The cars, will, they'll be competitors. That's not going to be there for that very long. The space, yes, our government has allowed this to and happen in a way that, and then Starlink, why has our government done this? The other thing is, it's not just Elon, it's like Mark has made decisions about where to put anti-Semitic, what to do with anti-Semitic content. If you right. want to understand why anti-Semitism is on the rise, that's me. Zuckerberg. Yeah. Yeah. He made a decision to let Holocaust deniers thrive on the system, and he and I argued about it in a very famous interview. 
And uh, he got in trouble for saying what he said, because he said, mm -hmm. he essentially said Holocaust deniers don't mean to lie, which I was like, oh my God, finish college, son. Like, it was really weird. Mm -hmm. And I was like, yes, they, I didn't say yes, they do. I let him talk about it, because I wanted you to understand mm -hmm. the depths of his right. lack of his ignorance, what mm -hmm. it was. Um, and then two years later, he changed it. But that was two years where stuff flowed over that system right. and was the primary news f source for much of the world, right. which is the, really disturbing when you think about so, it. So, okay, so you, you mentioned the opening scene of the book, which kind of flows into another opening scene, which mm -hmm. is Trump is elected, uh, a parade of tech titans, I guess, mm -hmm. what, who was there? Like Gates, All of them. Uh, uh, Musk. Gates uh, wasn't there. It was okay, Zuckerberg, you know, Bezos, Bezos, Sandberg. They're parading up to Trump Sergei. Tower to, to have Blair. a meeting yeah. with Trump. And that, I mean, that's kind of like where the capitalism after all things ends yeah. up. And first of all, were you, and you were surprised and, and disenchanted that they would actually sort of be throwing in so blatantly well, with this new president? Largely because they had literally spent a lot of time telling me what a buffoon he was, right? And that they were going to stop him and this and that. I, I didn't care what their politics was. It was more that they had this idea of they pushed tolerance and, you know, immigration. The two of them that were there, right. Elon and um, uh, uh, Satya Nadella, who's head of Microsoft, were immigrants themselves. Mm -hmm. And they had, what, what they had done, and at, I, I, this was actually a scoop of mine. I was, I was with my son buying food mm -hmm. for dinner at a, mar a beautiful market in San Francisco. And um, they had gone there without telling anybody. They were quietly sneaking in so they could get their tax breaks and their right. lack of regulation and their government contracts. They really thought they wouldn't be found out. Seriously, going in they, there. They, they didn't like, they, believe me, these people, if they I mean, go to the bathroom, people, yeah. they release a press release. Right. And so they didn't. And I was sort of like, wow. And so I called them all up and they're all like, oh, yeah, oh, oh, yeah, we're going. And I said, are you gonna say nothing about his 27,000 statements about immigrants? Like about that they're rapists, that they're dangerous? And they were like, well. well like, but if you're the CEO of like a massive company like Amazon, I mean, don't you, and if you're yes, invited you to talk to the president-elect, I mean, shouldn't yes, you, you do. like not- Yes, you do. Yes, you do. your shareholders, yeah. Incredibly, they're the richest people in the history of the world, helming the most powerful companies. So yes, sure. you do. Yeah. If these are your values that you've been, been pushing on all of us and telling us how important they are to you, yeah, you can't, yeah. They, they set themselves up as different. If it was hedge fund people, mm -hmm. they can go on and get their stuff. But these mm -hmm. people were different and, and portrayed themselves as different and put themselves in a different, in a different world. They're magicians, they're mm -hmm. here to save us. And so the only one who actually, we had, I had a good argument with was Elon, where he's, mm -hmm. and he, his take was, well, I will change his mind, because I can. And I was like, I called him Jesus. I'm like, listen, Jesus, good luck. And right. he's a stone cold racist, as far as I can tell, because um, of what he says. Mm -hmm. and, and then they skulked out. And the only person who benefited from that was Trump. Um, mm -hmm. And here's a moment where they could have said something about just immigration, just one thing. This, was, this is at the heart of Silicon Valley. Mm -hmm. um, and, 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 and he had strafed them and uh, said all kinds of nasty things about Bezos mm -hmm. and the rest of them. I just was, I, it, you know, I had already, listen, mm -hmm. my, the scales had fallen from my eyes around privacy, sure. around all monopoly right. and everything else. So it wasn't like I was like, oh, I can't believe my heroes are doing this. Um, but they were, it was a surprise, I think it was a surprise to a lot of people just mm -hmm. how cozy they got with Trump right away. I, I'm, one of the things I've been curious about, and also this, this goes to an overlap to the political world, which is where I cover, uh, mm -hmm. cults. The idea of cults of personality and yeah. whether they, are, they can operate independently of the actual cult leader. You know, you think of, you go, you know, can Apple uh, live beyond Steve Jobs? Yes, they We've, did. Obviously they just did. Just fine. You know, can... Bezos, whatever, any, yeah. take any number of tech, it's a fine. common thing. And then you have the question of, well, can Trumpism outlast Trump after yes. Trump gone? Is this, I mean, how do you see, I mean, do you see a parallel there? And is, I mean, do, do you see, a, what is the nature of kind of the Silicon Valley or the tech cult versus the political yeah. cults that grow uh, up? You know, you're talking about sort of the great man theory, right? The, or, or not so great man, I guess, yeah. in, the, in the Trump's case. Um, I think, you know, I think, Here's my feeling on it, and this is themed through the book. Mm -hmm. Guess what? Everybody dies. So yes, right. they'll be just fine. Like they'll, we'll get over him. We'll get over, right. you know, the Salem witch trials. We got over, you know, Jefferson Davis. We got over. You, you would go on and on and on. Trump um, has, by the way, compared his own um, ordeal to the Salem witch trials. Just I, so I'm you aware. Know. Just I'm he's aware. historically very cognizant. Yeah, except you know he calls it witch hunt, and I go, guess what? Mm -hmm. You're a witch. Um, yeah. But uh, but 
honestly, he's, he's actually quite a, a, he's a talented troll, I have to say. He uses the internet in a really astonishing way. Mm -hmm. um, and in fact, this week, he's trying to take True Social Public, which will give him an evaluation right now, because it's a meme stock, um, like GameStop. Mm -hmm. So he'll have $3.5 billion in value within that company, in value. Uh, he's got to hold on to it for six months, but mm -hmm. he'll be $3.5 billion richer in, on paper uh, next week, which will be interesting. But that's just a, a side, with because mm -hmm. uh, True Social has zero business. What's less than zero? What's negative revenue that right. company has? Um, but that doesn't matter because it's a meme stock. Um, so, you know, yeah, I think you can have a cult. I, I think everything outlasts, I think, I think light, time outlasts. Time, you know, has found you out is all yeah. for all of us. So, no, I don't think so. I think, you know, everyone when Steve Jobs died said nothing, the company was finished. And certainly right. it's, it's 10 times bigger from a shareholder yeah. point of view. It has all these products like the, the, the watch uh, and the AirPods and all kinds of things. Mm -hmm. You can argue, is it as magical? Okay, no, but it's pretty good. It's doing pretty Look good. What our phones are doing. Well, it's yeah. magical. It's magical in that they created a huge software and services business. I, I, again, it's not magical to me. It's just, a, mm -hmm. it's like, they, they, like they're, you know, they're selling shampoo. I don't know. It's just like they're selling something else. And, but they, again, because it's so necessary and addictive, mm -hmm. we treat it like it's more than cigarettes. Right. Right? That's the thing. So another thing I loved about the book is that it talks a lot about mortality. Not yeah. the funnest subject, but your father died when you were five. Mm -hmm. I mean, we've, we're now old enough so that we've known a lot of people who we were close yeah. to who have died. Sure. You, you kind of lingered on the example of Steve Jobs' death, and he had this iconic commencement address that everyone should look up at Stanford, basically about following your passion, about living your life as if you know you have limited time, which he sort of knew. He and, did. You know, well, and it's been, he was better than he thought he was. He was recovered. better than, but he had the sensibility embedded mm -hmm. in him. Um, first of all, talk a little bit about that. And, and there is a kind of, um, I wouldn't say desperation, ambition. It's some kind of box it's in. But there is a level of, you know, we have limited time. We are going to charge to the future, whether the future lasts till next week yeah. or we're all going to make ourselves immortal like Larry Ellison mm -hmm. or many of these, you know, anti-aging people. Yeah. Tell me what you learned from Steve Jobs, but also how it echoes to your own experience. Um, you know, I, I'm, I, Steve Jobs was a complex figure, let's be clear. He sure. could be very difficult. But it's, yeah. it was always, if you go and actually push on the idea of, of the anecdotes, they're always about a product. You know, mm -hmm. I was with Ted Sarandos, who runs Netscape now, mm -hmm. and he goes, well, Carrie, he could be mean. I said, well, what was he mean to you about? And he's like, well, Netscape, he, he, Netflix, 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 yeah. yeah. And he said, well, he, was, he yelled at us in a meeting. I go, well, what about? Did he call you a moron or a boob or something? Mm -hmm. He goes, no, he was mad about the color red of our Netscape icon on the app, and he didn't like it. He, didn't, mm -hmm. he thought it was bad red. And I was like, oh, and he goes, he was really mad about the red. And I go, well, was the red bad? He goes, the red was bad. Mm -hmm. So he was right. And so I was like, well, I don't care if he's mad about that. That's a pro right. He was trying to make the products as beautiful as possible, and that was his thing was product, the, the, the product, coming, product design and function coming mm -hmm. together. He was brilliant at that. Absolutely. Um, and that's why he was legendary in a lot of ways. Um, but I thought he was very, one thing about him that I think people miss, and I think, I think the biography missed it, is that he was passionless. He was full of passion. The man was too much. What do you mean? Well, because everyone was like, why was he so, why did he get upset about products? Because he looked, because it, he had passion for it. He, he really did have passion for life. And so. But where does the passion list come in? Well, because, you know, cold. He wasn't cold. Oh, he was yeah. warm. He was too hot. You know what I mean? Mm -hmm. Almost. And so I think people miss that about him. And I really appreciate someone who hurdles through life like that. Mm -hmm. I really did. Because he was in a hurry. He, I think maybe he had a sense of his impending doom, maybe, mm -hmm. um, or his early demise, really. Yeah. And, I just feel like he, he lived life like that all the time. And one of the things he did that I think made him better than a lot of people, one, he was an adult. Uh, he wouldn't be tweeting right now, trust me. Um, he, he, he read widely. He tried to meet people he disagreed with. He was, mm -hmm. People don't know, he spent a lot of time with Rupert Murdoch trying to mm -hmm. shift him. Um, that was interesting. What was your name for him? Uncle Satan. Uncle Satan. Um, so. <laughs> lovingly, loving it. No, it wasn't loving in any way. Yeah. Um, he's a terrible. Ter I have. I always say that between a gerrymandering social media and Rupert Murdoch, that's what, what's what happened. This is the, if I had to pick three things that happened to our country, those three together, I would put together very tightly. Um, so, uh, Uncle Satan. Uh, 
but Steve was Steve had a, had an, a vision for the future that he kept going, and he did it the way he wanted to do it. He didn't. Mm -hmm. He very only a few times would go off and try to mm -hmm. follow, which I liked. Um, he had points of view, which I liked after considering it. He had great taste, mm -hmm. um, and he really did have. Um, I, you know, one of the. I'm famous for interviews, but one of the interviews I did with him, we did the last interview before he died, mm -hmm. um, that he was able to move around, mm -hmm. essentially. And um, he was skeletal, skeletal. He really mm -hmm. looked like on death's door when he was mm -hmm. doing it. You can go see this interview, because one thing we did with Uncle Satan is when he died, we knew he had some affection for Steve, so we got him to take copyright off of all our interviews. Uncle Satan's still Uncle alive, Satan's you know. still, uh, of course yes, he is. Yes. He's not going, Nosferatu's not going yeah, anywhere anytime 94, soon. 94, whatever he is. What, yeah, whatever, he'll be 110, mm -hmm. trust me. Um, don't turn your back on that guy. Um, so, uh, so he took off copyrights, you can see it, but he's skeletal in the mm -hmm. videos, and you can see them when you do it. And I was looking at him, and. I asked this question, which I thought about for five seconds, but I said, don't think about it too hard. Mm -hmm. And I said, um, what are you gonna do before, what are you gonna do with the rest of your life? Mm -hmm. And the crowd went, oh my God, she just asked a, a very clearly right. dying man what he's gonna do with the So people knew? Oh, it was hard not to see. He was to very see, sick. but did okay. Right. Yes, it was okay. clear he was. He, you know, he looked like a cancer mm -hmm. victim, which is what he was, mm -hmm. um, and and uh, very very thin, very very thin, mm -hmm. and. He gave the best answer about uh, uh, what essentially became streaming television. He goes, here's how I do television. Like, mm -hmm. And I right. love that. I was, it was like he wasn't thinking about you know, big thoughts. He was still going. And so I appreciated that. But there was a side moment you had with him offstage that I you did. describe in the book in which he was much more sentimental. And he said, much more. You know, it's only about people who love you. And he hugged you. He did. That was and awkward. And it was weird, but it was also beautiful in a way. Mm. Um, it was more awkward. I don't like getting weird. hugged by it people like that. It was weird. Hugging. Okay. He was, he was talking about, I'm not a hugger, as you might imagine, um, except my kids. Um, but uh, he was very upset uh, about, he wanted to know about my, I had just had a second child. My, my ex-wife had one. I had one. Mm -hmm. um, and he wanted to know who the father was. And so I explained the whole, this was mm -hmm. early on in lesbians yeah. having kids. So he was like, I'd like to know. And I'm like, yeah. okay, fine, you asked. What year was this? Oh, 2003, something yeah. like that. Um, and there weren't a lot, of, there, there were, but not a lot. Mm -hmm. And not a lot of people, not a lot of straight people knew about it, that's for sure. And so he asked and I told him, and then he said, oh, so you don't know who the father is? And I said, well, it's a no donors, we can't find out, but I bet soon with genetics, we could probably find him. Right. And he goes, don't find him. Huh. And I was like, wow, Steve, none of your beeswax, but okay. And he goes, don't he find him. And then he told me the whole story of his adoption, yeah. which I didn't know, actually, mm -hmm. I really didn't. And, and it was gripping, it was a gripping story of how he found his dad, he didn't like him, and he hurt his parents, his adopted parents while doing mm -hmm. it. It was one hell of a story. Mm -hmm. and, and then he said the people who really, and he was very disappointed on meeting his father Not briefly either. in a restaurant, yeah. actually, he was a restaurateur, and he didn't like them. And he said that your real people who love you are the people who love you, and then he hugged me, which was, I was like, oh God, no. And I could see him coming in. I'm like, okay. Well, I'll hug you. although it's, it's kind of ironic in your case because you have such fond and loving memories of the man you only knew for five That's years. Right. And then the, the father you did not choose, choose. Not be, you know, turned out not to be the greatest guy. No, like. I mean, um, I'm not calling myself Cinderella, but he was a very, he's so an asshole. Let me ask you this. I mean, the, uh, um, I mean, a lot, I mean, one of the other things I liked about the book was that you, you definitely take the entrepreneurial example of the people you write about I do. And, and put it to your own entrepreneurial career as a journalist, mm -hmm. an entrepreneurial journalist. Where, do you have a word report for that? Reportrepreneur. It's a terrible word. word. No, but in it's a way, mine. many people in our business have become that, and you are the now, ultimate. Yes, right? we were the OG, me and Walt. No, I think, yeah, you and Walt. But, yeah. but I guess the, but the takeaway from like when you go from jobs to that speech to what we're talking about here is follow your passion, basically. Right. And, and, that's very inspiring in some ways, but it's also true, isn't it also true, that roughly 90% of the population doesn't have the luxury of following their passion. They have, to, they have to go to jobs that they really don't particularly like Absolutely. to pay their bills. Absolutely, 100%. So, right, so this, is, this does come from a place of privilege sure, to some but degree, Sure, but that's right? what all, you know, all anyone in college or, or things like that has that. My, my point was that anyone who has choices, I always say this right. to students when they ask me, I'm especially like you know, you're at the University of Pennsylvania or wherever I happen to be, mm -hmm. and I'm like, y'all have choices. Other mm -hmm. people do not have choices. By the way, we, I think we do have to give people more choices at all levels. I'm mm -hmm. kind of a proponent of universal basic income in a way, because I think it could mm -hmm. unlock 
mm -hmm. a lot of creativity and entrepreneurial spirit. Mm -hmm. I mean, if you think about it, the U.S. was based on entrepreneurs. Farmers are the original mm -hmm. entrepreneurs, really. Mm -hmm. if, you, if you really... If only they had podcasts. That's right, that's mm -hmm. right. Um, but you, whatever way you do it, um, it does come from a place of privilege, but I could have stuck with the New York Times, Wall Street Journal, Washington Post world for a very long time, and I was mm -hmm. very dissatisfied with it because I could see the seeds of destruction in it. Right, right but all right. those places are the top of your profession also. That's right, right. but I didn't stay within those systems because I was worried about it. So right. I think whatever b job you happen to be in, mm -hmm. there's much more entrepreneurial spirit in this country than we, than we allow, mm -hmm. and we help get people there in terms of, of getting them there. We tend to try to shove people in the buckets, right. um, including vocational training, including all these certificates. So mm -hmm. interesting, some yeah. of the educational stuff that's happening that gives people a leg up. And as AI starts, we're not gonna talk about AI a lot, as you said, but as it starts, you've gotta start thinking about where the jobs really are, where the right. real jobs are gonna be in the future. Right. Well, there's a line in the book, I, I have a million lines in the book that I kind of underline. Here's one of them. Uh, Steve Jobs would a poor, uh, a poor Elon Musk. He would. And uh, they did know each other, obviously. Mm, I don't think very, Elon wasn't very well known then. Why would Steve Jobs abhor Because he didn't like, uh, well, you know, he wasn't, he didn't like, I, I can't imagine Steve Jobs tweeting anti-Semitic, anti-trans. Anti One would hope, yeah. Uh, he wouldn't, he wouldn't. He yeah. just wouldn't, it just, I can't, it would be shocking to me. Yeah. Um, I, I don't think he liked, uh, you know, he obviously was a performer and he was, you know, sort of a, he was performative, but mm -hmm. it was all in, in, it wasn't for himself, it was for the products. Right. He was super interested in getting the products out, right. you know, pulling it, oh, one more thing, look what I have, an iPod. Mm -hmm. um, and it was always in that regard. And it wasn't, it wasn't self, it wasn't for himself, mm -hmm. it was for the company, which was a very different thing. And Elon started off that way, mm -hmm. and then it became very clear it was a lot about him. Mm -hmm. um, so I don't think he would have liked the, the jazz hands, the, the, the sort of toxic jazz hands that are going on right now with right. him. Which is, you know, which is wrapped up in drug use, mental illness, all kinds yeah. of things are happening with that guy. And, and the fan base that he has, as you said, the cult that, mm -hmm. just like Trump, keeps him, oh, sir, you're so smart, that kind right. of thing. Right. Oh, for, before I forget, we were having lunch. You were texting with Hillary Clinton. I was. Because that's the kind of gal Kara That's the is, kind of gal I am. A lot of famous friends. She and texted me. I don't she, know. Okay. She texted you. You go up. You have a conversation with she liked Hillary. The book. She liked the book. Uh, and then she told, she said, oh, I got a great story for you about Elon. And I said, can I ask you about it? And you said, yes. yes so what yes. is the story? She so um, she's actually a real geek. Hillary Clinton's a kind of a geek. It's interesting. She's very adept at the, you'd be surprised how quick she is with all this mm -hmm. stuff. And she got these people right away. And I really like that about her. She, you know, she's a student of power and she's, mm -hmm. she's done it herself. So she knows a thing or two about it. And so she understood their power very quickly. And mm -hmm. she often tried to reach out to them. I mean, the she tech did, people. Yeah, she knew a lot of them. And she came to some of our early conferences. That's how I know her. Um, and was very eager to do so. And of course, she had the Russians on her in a, mm -hmm. in a you know, the vast right-wing conspiracy turned out just to be social media. Yeah. Um, and she was ahead on that. And if you actually go back and look at a lot of her quotes, you're sort of like, ooh, right again. Yeah. Once again, right. And she was ahead of real prescience about it. So I always appreciated her. Mm -hmm. um, her she's such a smart person um, and a canny person. Whatever you like her or not, she's very mm -hmm. smart. Um, and so she was telling me the story. One of the things that turned, that really was the end of my line with Elon Musk was when Paul Pelosi got beaten mm -hmm. by yeah. a guy who had been radicalized online by right. in a QAnon way. The whole, the whole, everything right. that came together and, and mental about, illness, yes. the whole thing showed up at Nancy Pelosi's house in San Francisco. Nancy was not there. Paul was there um, and hit him on the head with a hammer. Uh, and he's an older man. He's a very, he's a, he's a very fit man, but he's older and he got knocked down by the hammer and his head was bashed in. And he went to the hospital. And the day that, that the night after it happened, Elon suddenly decided after he just bought Twitter to, Hillary said, uh, this is terrible. This guy was radical. It looks like he was radicalized. And she was entirely right. And, and Elon responded to her tweet by saying, maybe it was this. Oh, so he was responding to a Hillary Clinton tweet. Yes, people okay. don't realize that. He was responding yeah. to Hillary's tweet. And, and he, tweet, he retweeted, he put in there a, a, a right-wing conspiracy site, or a, yeah. not right-wing, I don't even know, it's way down deep in the dang yeah. memes, that it was a gay love triangle and that it was not this. Like, this is the guy who runs the service, is, is spreading conspira like very yeah. clear conspiracy theories. And I was, I was shocked. This guy mm -hmm. literally was, was on death's door. And, mm -hmm. and so Hillary found someone who knew him. And she was going to um, 
she was going to uh, uh, she was going to tweet something, you fucking asshole, or something like that. Mm -hmm. You know, she's very clever with the tweets. She's yeah. very good with the tweets. Um, one of the things she just tweeted about Donald Trump was, I guess this guy is not as good off four years ago as he was today. But it was That's very funny. funny. Yeah. It was funny. She's funny. She's funny. She's good at it. Um, so. Um, so she, 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 she was going to tweet something, then she, she didn't. She stopped herself, because she didn't need the, need the dunk when these people were suffering. Right. And uh, she got someone who knew him to contact him, give her her number. And the two of them went back and forth in a text, oh. which was interesting. And he took it down at her behest. You know, she asked him to take really? it down. Yes. Wait, so Hillary Clinton asked him to take his Paul Pelosi tweet down, and he did? And he finally did. He didn't. She, she noted, and I agree with her, that he didn't think there was anything wrong with it. But he, he, he took it down at her behest. How long was it up for? Too long. Yeah. It was long enough. Really? And so he took it down because she, they, tweet, they texted. And his last text to her, uh, he said, I'm sorry, uh, but I guess I shouldn't be tweeting at 4 AM, which says everything, right? Mm -hmm. Which is when he put it up, right? Yeah. Which means he was, whatever yep. was going on with him at 4 he, Either lack of sleep or whatever he was doing. And, um, and he took it down. And then he said publicly, or his people told me, that they apologized to Paul Pelosi. And I, of course, called Paul Pelosi. And I said, did he apologize to you? And he said, absolutely not. He never did. Um, A lie. Hello, he lied. Could, so. uh, first of all, if there are any reporters here, I mean, this is off the record. but No, I don't care. No, no, care. use it. Yeah, it's, like, it's not off the record. I don't care. Um, you can say off the record. Uh, Sorry, you got, Hillary. Can you ask Hello. Hillary to leak that text exchange? Because I actually be, would no, be curious to see their back. I don't think no, she I don't think she didn't want to know. It was really... Um, I don't, I, you know, he, he, he had to take it down. The pressure yeah. was enormous on him, and even his, friend, his family was horrified. See, here's what's sick about this whole thing. Mm -hmm. You know, the, the guy who did this, it wouldn't He's running the, the company. No, the, the guy, the, the attacker. Yeah. You know Trump is going to pardon him, like, on... Oh, no, I hope not. No. No, there'll be, that's kind of how I don't think he can be pardoned. It's a state, I think he can't be pardoned. Let's... He cannot be. He's being actually. He was. He was federally uh, convicted. Now he's being convicted in the state. So they're worried about that. Yes. Okay. Let's pivot. Right. See what I did there, to a uh, a more um, nourishing mm -hmm. part of mortality, which is you had a stroke. I did. Um, about what ten years ago, or the same month, Steve. Same two weeks after Steve Jobs died, so I, 2010 or 11. I didn't know this. It was oh. an incredible story. You're on your way to Asia. You had a, uh, you were in a long flight, middle seat or something like that. Yeah, Uncle Satan uh, wasn't paying for first but, class. So. But the takeaway from this section was basically, um, everyone says, Carrie, you got to stop and smell the flowers. And they did. And you said, your concluding line here was, I don't want to smell the flowers. And my question for you is, do you want to smell flowers a little bit? I don't like cut flowers, so no. Well, I, I, it's an expression that... I know what it is. No, like, yeah. it's none of your business what I want to do with the rest of my life. I was like, a lot of people patted me, like, oh, now you need to see. My stroke had nothing to do with my hard work. My stroke had to do with I had a hole in my heart, and I had blood that was thicker than other people. It's called F. Leiden. It was all genetic or whatever. I was right. born with Right. I'm it. not asking you a literal question. Right. I, but you seem averse to smelling the flowers. I you want smell, to keep, it sounds I like you want children. You think I'm not smelling flowers? Like I decided instead to have children than smell flowers. That's, That's all. That's not mutually. Exclusive. That's my side hustle. Is my kids? You know. So I, no. I, this is another way of asking you. How, what do you? How do I relax? Of, no, I don't care how you relax. I, I mean, go to the hardware store like any good. No, 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 no. But I mean, what do, you have like been on this wonderful trajectory. It's more like this. Kids, whatever. I mean, ten years. I mean, like, where do you see? Uh, I'm not gonna. This is. Where do you see all this going? I don't know. For Cara. I mean, it's com. the ride. You know, there's an yeah. expression with, um, uh, I, I read my kids, uh, Mary Poppins, and mm -hmm. um, I'll, I'll leave when the wind changes. That's how I've done my career. I'll mm -hmm. leave when the wind, I just, whenever I decide to, I will. And what happens is when I get an idea in my head, like when I, with podcasting, mm -hmm. I, I just sold my company for quite a lot of money. Mm -hmm. to. Are you to rich bank. enough to be unhappy? Because you know, because like if you're over a hundred million dollars, don't answer I'm not that question. I'm not hundred, Scott. All right, because uh, then you'd be unhappy. I'd be happy. I'd be just fine. Right. Um, but um, uh, but uh, I uh, I'm doing okay. But right, it was all. By yeah. the way, it's stuff I made, FYI, Absolutely. and created jobs, and I feel good about that. Mm -hmm. um, but um, I I uh, I don't know. It depends. When I did podcasting, I told Jim. I literally called Jim Bankoff. I'm like, there's this thing called podcasting. Remember Steve Jobs talked about it? I'm going to do it and I'm not running the thing you just bought. And mm -hmm. thankfully, he's like, okay, 
and it's turned out to be a pretty big business. Um, same thing with uh, right now, I'm just obsessed with video and not just, not short form video because everyone's losing their minds over TikTok, which is not going away, children. It's not going away, it'll be around. I told my sons don't care, they hate TikTok, so it doesn't matter, but it's not going away. Um, and I, I'm really interested in video and, and I just signed a deal actually with CNN because everyone was saying cable was over and I don't believe it. So I was like, oh, wow. I don't That's believe good. it. It's, you know, it's a worldwide global television network. Really? Mm -hmm. You can't make a business out of it? How stupid can you be if you can't make a business out of it? Sorry. Uh, so I, I'm going to try. So I'm Rachel Maddow, too. Nice to meet you. <laughs> <laughs> uh, okay. So, um, you, okay. You have a heart out. I have a million yeah. more questions. But yeah. we are going to, uh, I guess this is where we turn the, I'm going to have to take some audience questions. Right. Uh, I don't know if there are microphones and whatever. There, there's something going on here. Uh, my only thing, the only thing I would ask is because Kara has a heart out, no speeches, please ask very precise questions. We'll Sounds try to get as many questions in as possible. Sure. We'll do a lightning round with, uh, okay. with Kara. Cool. Hi. Hi. Uh, uh, so my question was, you touched on this a little bit about how tech industry is made of a lot of big personalities. Mm -hmm. What do you think led to this perception of tech more than other industries being driven by large personalities specifically? Mm -hmm. And how do you think this affects the impact that these big figures have on the rest of you know, society? Right. Well, you have to remember, these are the founders. You know, this is like Thomas Edison wandering around or, or anybody who founded things and or the beginnings of Hollywood. Those were, they were like that too. It just, there wasn't the internet to have them in our face all the time. Um, I think the first one was the Iacocca was a star. There was, there's been business stars since the 80s, essentially. Or the or barbarians at the gate with all the, the, uh, the investment bankers. Uh, you knew them. Why? Who knows? To, uh, bonfire of the vanities, all kinds of things. And the same thing with politics has happened. It's not an, it, this idea of, of strong, a great man is not the thing. So it, these are founders, and so they're going to be different than the people that were now, are now going to take over. Like the Satya Nadella is not like Bill Gates. He's actually doing better than Bill Gates. The he's the new CEO. He's the CEO of Microsoft, but he's, he's turned it into a $3 trillion company. Bill Gates never did that, but Bill Gates, he, but Satya couldn't have started it. So you, a startup personality is a very different personality. And so we're, we're with the founders, and by nature, founders are very religious. I think that's the, we're in a religious place. They're very religious in the way they run things. Religious in what sense? Meaning they, got, they have to do it. They, but not they, like in the God sense. No, not at all. They, yeah. No, 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 no. It's more like it, it's that their, their motivation becomes money in many mm -hmm. ways, but it, it is also it's born out of either anger or they have to make it or invention or whatever. So you're going to get those kinds of people, and they have a lot of similar characteristics in that regard, persistence, inability to... Uh, uh, to, to take failure as a failure kind of thing and things. You have to have a certain mental state. One thing they do love is quoting um, uh, Thomas Edison, speaking of founders. By the way, Thomas Edison was a jerk, was a jerk, like a real jerk, but a real founder. He stole all kinds of things. He, he really messed with Tesla, Nikola Tesla, like kind of cruelly. Um, so, uh, so, you know, you're going to get that kind of competition, and that was mm -hmm. Henry Ford and or Carnegie. They all competed with each other. John D. Rockefeller, very similar personalities. Um, so I don't think that's a different thing. I think they're going to fade away, as do mm -hmm. founders. And in, in this case, they're rich, and they go to Fiji, really, a lot of them. Um, but and some the, of them stay around. And the genetic construct, which we didn't really get into. What's that, genetic? No, just the maleness of it. Yes, and it's this very is, male. But well, it's also, I mean, just from how you describe it, and it really brought it home, was this is, I mean, the sexist culture of Silicon Valley, when you compare yeah. it to really any other I would agree. company, town, or whatever industry, is really unmatched. Yeah, it makes investment banking look like a lesbian collective. But, <laughs> Next question. Sorry. It's a great, it's a great place to end. Yeah. Yeah. Hi, my name's Yang, graduate student from sociology. Hi. So tech utopianism appears bipartisan. Yeah. Even Newt Gingrich in the 90s was a tech evangelist. He was. I, I used to travel the country <laughs> yeah. with him. I so have he, some fun stories with Newt Gingrich, but go ahead. Yeah, yeah. He Renee would Brown. Silicon Valley with such warming and liberating vocabulary. Mm -hmm. However, when tech utopianism is married with, de with deregulation, which has been there for almost 30 years, mm -hmm. and rising geopolitical tension with China today, I'm not sure if it could be a toxic brew. It is. Uh, for instance, the TikTok ban is likely to benefit Facebook mm -hmm. if without similar industrial level 
regulation in terms of I agree. user data privacy. So to what extent will this tech utopianism deregulation with the new geopolitics lead to even less accountability from um, the Silicon Valley, big well, tech? Well, less, there's none. Let's just be clear. There's no laws governing our thing. And this rush to TikTok, let me separate the Communist Party of China. We should not, we should have, we, they're, they're a foreign adversary, I'm sorry. I, whether you like it or not, that's the situation. And we have to be cognizant of the possibilities of propaganda, both propaganda and surveillance, proven or unproven, the possibilities. We also can't operate in, our com companies can't operate in China. So let's leave that aside. There should, the, the way they wrote this bill in the House, and I just did a show on it, it will be on on Monday. I, I did it with Alex Stamos, who ran, uh, it was the CIO of Facebook for years, and Taylor Lorenz. Um, and the way they wrote this is going to be, uh, is going to be overturned in courts um, because uh, they're going to force Apple and Google into to push to, uh, to, to doing things they don't want to do against their own First Amendment rights. It's going gonna, it's gonna to be a problem. If they had created a privacy bill and a data bill that affected everybody and then in particular said when it's a foreign adversary, special rules, we've done that before a million times. When Rupert Murdoch came to this country, he had to become an American citizen in order to own things. We have foreign ownership rules, everything else. And in this case, they haven't passed a bill in 30 years. They've spent, and, and, and tech has gone right up through the middle while our politics has fractured. So imagine if AT&T didn't get broken up because the, our government was so dysfunctional or Standard Oil didn't get broken up, right? These, these, it, they've been able to do it and then they have money and the means to stop any kind of the lobbying is intense. Poor Amy Klobuchar had a, like a, a raft of very important serious bills and they got killed. They got killed by both sides. But instead, they can do it on, on just bike dance. They shouldn't do that. It should be a national privacy bill that deals with the issue of foreign adversaries, about surveillance, about propaganda, about algorithmic transparency. They should have all those things, but instead they're rushing this bill through. It's, it, maybe it'll be fixed in the Senate. I'm just going to wait until I decide what they're going to do. Um, but there's, you know, there's a lot of issues here that we have to get right. This is their only chance to do this, finally, and they're doing this, which means it's cloddish, you know, the way they're doing it. We'll see um, if they can figure something out. Often government does tend to get to a good place eventually. This particular bill from the House is not a good one, but it has a good chance of going through. It'll go to courts and then it'll be slow, but it does benefit. It shouldn't benefit anybody. It should benefit the American people, not, not Facebook or anybody else. And they should be held to the same standards of privacy as any other company. But there are special issues we need to focus in on by a Chinese-owned broadcast network, uh, which it is. So it's, it's very complex, but we should, uh, we should definitely uh, deal, with, deal with the bigger issue is the, the deleterious effects of these companies on our our society and the, and the, and they're, they're in, I call them rapacious information thieves and they're taking your information, chewing it up, vomiting it out and charging you for it. That's, that's fantastic. That's a good business plan, but not for us, not for the rest of us. Thank you. Sorry. Uh, hey, before the last question, the shades indoors thing, yeah. is that like a, a, no, I, a vision the light thing? Is bright, so it's I the have, light, okay. Yes, I have a light. Because no, it's sort of your trademark too, it so is, I didn't but know I if it was really, like. I have a light problem with my eyes and, 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 okay. and most, most people are fine with it. But. Okay, no, no, it's awesome. Yeah. But yeah. Uh, it, it's because it works as like a trademark and everything. Anyway, right, yes. next okay. question. Sure, yeah. I like it. Yeah. So again, so, I like yeah. it. So <laughs> you, know, you know the Woody Guthrie song? Uh, many, yeah. There's so many. Mind your own business so you won't be minding mine. Go ahead. I'm teasing. Hello. I love you. He's a friend of mine. Go ahead. Um, my name is Kelly. I'm a computer science PhD student and former tech worker. Uh, I guess I was curious, having experienced a lot of the Silicon Valley-ness that you've talked about, if you thought there was some sort of alternative, and in particular, if you've come across people actually building technology in yeah. non-great hero ways that are compelling? I think some of the newer, tech, the younger technologists are better. I just I have a much easier time talking to current entrepreneurs. Um, they seem a little more worldly. They seem a little more aware of politics. They're much more interested in climate change and things like that. They're more mission-driven in a way that I think they actually believe the mission versus, you know, I did a story when I got to the Wall Street Journal, 10 things tech people will tell you that are a lie, one of which was we're here to change the world. We're just like you. Um, we just want to build a community when they, in fact, had complete stock control where they couldn't be fired ever and their children couldn't be fired, which, again, is called a kingship. 
Um, and so they used to say all these things. I mean, if I had a dollar for every time Mark Zuckerberg said community to me, I'd be a billionaire. But it was bullshit. He ran the community. He was the king of the community. So I think new technologists seem to be a little more mission driven. People in climate change tech are really cool. They're really cool, interesting, and of different ages, and they're much more diverse. Let me tell you, they're much more diverse people. We had a whole day of them at one of my conferences, you know, uh, heat exchangers, solar, uh, putting, there was a woman putting things on piers, um, and it, just cool stuff. Um, healthcare tech is really, people working on that, I'm really interested. Yeah, robotics a little more, but yes, I think I'm much more interested in younger people in general. Um, and I do think in the, in the social media space, for example, um, people 18 to 25 seem okay and figure, they aren't panicking the way the people 25 to 50 are. They're the crazy people on the internet. They're like, a, they're addicted and obsessed and dunking and I have two kids, I have four kids, but two of them are, are 19 and 21. They seem just fine, you know, mm -hmm. so, and, and much more, have, they have a more global perspective. Does this cohort give you hope on the yes. diversity inclusion, just like, you know, the get, mitigating the sexism? Yes, I've been wrong before, so we'll mm -hmm. see. We'll see. I don't know. Yeah. yeah. Yes. So. Thank you. Good. Uh, hey, Kara. Hi. I'm Rohit. I'm Hi. a master's student at the Harris School. Hi. We've had a lot of committee hearings uh, where there's a lot of talk, but not yes. much happens. Yes. Uh, especially around AI, I want to ask you, like, is there a, like a systematically responsible way to develop this? There's a lot of externalities. Sure. We're unsure who is in charge of that. So that's kind of what I want to ask. Like, how can this time be different? The government has to be involved. This, the government hasn't been involved, and the only rule that they have to govern tech is advantageous to them. It's the Section 230. Now, we can't get rid of that now. It's impossible at this point. It's, it's like a, it's a growth in the middle of the heart. It's not coming out of this thing. So one thing, and that, that, that hinders liability. There's got to be some liability, much more liability attached. Uh, those parents in the here, the latest hearing was Mark putting up the pictures of them. None of those parents can sue Mark Zuckerberg. Why not? Why can't they sue him even if they lose, right? They can't sue him. Why? Uh, why can't they Section 230, he's immune. <coughs> he's immune. He's immune. It's, he can walk down Fifth Avenue and ruin teen girls' lives. It's fine. Um, so there has to be a level of liability. That's one. Two, there has to be any regulation around privacy, algorithmic transparency, hacking disclosure. I could name 10, 12 things that they could do that would, you know, go to the money, go to the data, go to the stuff that isn't First Amendment screaming at each other. There's tons of it. There's tons and tons. Instead, we waste our time arguing about the First Amendment when we should be focused in on data, like where's data? And AI is at the center of this. I'm talking very quickly, we've got seven minutes. Um, but AI is at the center of this because they're doing it again. They're sucking in all the data for their LLMs. You don't know what they're gonna do. The government's not involved. So big companies are making these decisions without your input, without the government input. And even if we insult the government all the time, which these guys love to do, I mean, the, the top one is Elon who has Government contracts all out the yin yang. And by the way, Tesla would have died without a government loan from the Obama administration. So thank you, Obama. Like, you know, it's kind of ridiculous for him to attack the government given how much he's benefited from it. Um, and by the way, we, he came to this country. Like, he got to be an American citizen, everything else. Like, he should love our government in, in many, he doesn't have to because he's who he is, but nonetheless. So we have to like really get the government involved. We get it, it has to be a global basis because we have global agreements on nuclear uh, weapons and nuclear power. We have global agreements on cloning. We have global agreements on, on, on all kinds of things. We can have a global agreement on AI. On, like, okay, let me start. Do we want drone killer AI armies? No. Like, yeah, I think we can agree. Now, maybe some three or four people are like, that's freaking cool. But otherwise, no, like we can agree on that. We can agree on safety and, and making sure the data doesn't, doesn't discriminate. Yeah, let's agree on that. Let's agree, you know, there's all kinds of things and that's where the government has to step in. The problem is the government has limited resources compared to these companies. They're, they're nation states as far as I'm concerned. Hmm. Trillions of dollars, trillions of dollars and they can do whatever they want. So. Although they are, you know, in Facebook's case, they seem to be the masters of the after the fact apology. Uh, oh, they don't point. apologize. In that, in that hearing, go back and look at it. Mark did not say that he turned to the parents. And first of all, and I've said this at several things, and I want to drill this into you. Josh Hawley, one of the worst public servants of our time, um, because he's very smart and he knows better, said to Mark, you need to apologize to these parents in a most performative, ridiculous moment. 
I, I think he, Mark should have turned around as you need to apologize to these people because guess who in this room has the power to actually do legislation to stop me? You do, Josh Hawley, and you don't do it because all you want to do is dunk and give the yay sim signal to insurrectionists. He's an idiot because he, he was trying to create a moment that he could raise money off of. He's heinous in that regard. Everyone up there is heinous for not passing bills when they have the power to do so. Um, but nonetheless, you have Mark looking at these parents, and instead of, and look, Mark is a capitalist. He's a he has shareholders to deal with. I get his little game. Um, but um, he turned to them, and, it's, and he has no risk in saying this. He did not say, I'm so sorry for what I, if I, anything I invented hurt your children. I am so sorry. Let's figure it out together. He could have done that. He could have done, I'm so sorry. I, I didn't think right, maybe, and maybe we need to improve it. He said, I'm so sorry for what happened to you. Hmm. Think about that, what it takes to say that to parents whose children really did get to have issues. Online was, was, it, was a contributing factor, not maybe the only one, but certainly a contributing factor in their deaths. You were the victim of germs. The wind is yes, blameless. Yes, yes. Right? I'm so sorry it's hot outside. Yeah. Well, I did nothing. That's what that is saying to you. That's terrible, I think. Terrible. Thank and you. he has Love no risk. He has no risk to say so. Hmm? Uh, Thank you. Okay, two, we have three minutes yeah. and 44 seconds. Hi, Squeeze uh, in two or long <laughs> one. Anyway, go as fast as you can. Yeah, my name is Uchenna, uh, longtime listener, first year MPP student at, at Harris School, uh, former techie. I'm mm -hmm. doing tech policy now. Cool. I guess my question now is I saw what you said in your book. What worries you the most is the apathy in the face of all the internet convenience. Mm -hmm. What would you say to student leaders who are looking to actually exit tech or do things with politicians to actually build those laws? What would you recommend to us outside well, of the, the I think tech? the problem is, it's unlike cigarettes, not everyone smoked a cigarette, but everybody needs this stuff. Um, and I think that's what that the issue is. Everyone, you have, it's, it's addictive and it's necessary. And, and so you can't escape it the way you could. And you can't really put warning signals on it. There's, it's going to be very hard. And so you've got to think really hard. What, I, to me, it's pretty basic. A privacy bill, an algorithmic transparency bill, better antitrust legislation. A lot of it is very block and tackle of what we did with other powerful companies over the years. But we certainly can't let it take two years for Mark Zuckerberg to realize Holocaust deniers are toxic. Oh. Oh, now I realize. Then he kicked them off the platform two years later. How much anti-Semitic toxic waste coursed through the bloodstream of America during that, until he figured it out? That, to me, that is very dangerous. He's, it's like a super broadcaster. Mm -hmm. And so start getting in there and start to find ways. And one of the ways with AI they're suing people is, um, is through um, copyright. Um, and I'll leave you with one last thing. I did an interview, by the way, I did an interview with Marguerite Vestager, who's the one who's actually driving the Silicon Valley people crazy with laws. They have the Digital Markets Act and the Digital Services Act in Europe. Europe's doing a great job. It's just that it's Europe, right? It's not here. Um, and they, she just fined Apple $2 billion. Meanwhile, the Justice Department just started to sue them. She's already fined them. She's already like, give me $2 billion. Like, she's already on to the next step. Um, you should listen to that. But one of the things, and I'll leave you with this, the guy, I interviewed one of the parents of the Sandy Hook, um, um, kids who were killed at Sandy Hook, wonderful guy. He's trying for years to try to get people who have gotten radicalized to stop mm -hmm. using his child as a conspiracy theory mm -hmm. uh, puppet. And he's, he's changed people's minds. He got, a lot of the people who did that were mothers who couldn't believe it happened and therefore it wasn't true. That's how they got radicalized. Mm -hmm. He's turned a lot of those people around. He could not get Facebook to take down the heinous things Alex Jones put up there. Alex Jones, there's not a hell deep enough for that guy, what he's done to these people. I made it my life's work to make sure that people understand this about what this guy has done with digital tools. He, he made people miserable, Miser people who had lost the worst thing. I have kids, just the idea of it. The fact that they didn't find him and hunt him down, I can't believe. So, um, so anyway, so I have 49 seconds, I'm gonna do very fast. So he could not get Facebook to take down that stuff. He couldn't get him to take it down for moral reasons, for this reasons, he was breaking, he broke every rule of Facebook. They wouldn't take it down. Do you know why they took it down finally? He figured it out, copyright. These mm. horrible people had taken pictures he had taken of his now dead son and started to manipulate them. So they only took it down because of very good copyright laws we have in this country. This is a grieving parent, had to go this far to do this. Something is wrong. And, and he's a hero, but why did he have to spend 
his life after it had been ruined by this terrible shooter and then made worse by, a, 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 I don't even know what to call him, this, this pernicious, pernicious monster like Alex Jones to do this. Those companies should have done something about it and it took that. So whatever it takes to stop them or get them to do the right thing, let's use those legally mm -hmm. and in ways. Shaming them is not gonna work. Suing them certainly is, or doing, being able to stop them. And so that's what I'd leave you with, is to think about that. You shouldn't have your decisions made by billionaires. I'm sorry, I like money, I make a lot of money. Like, I like money, but they don't know what they're talking about. They don't, I know them. They shouldn't have these decisions, they shouldn't be making these decisions. Your elected officials should be making them, and you should elect the officials that can make good decisions. We always trash government, but we elected them. We, nobody elected Elon Musk, no one elected Mark Zuckerberg, no one elected any of these people, and they, they are not up to the task going forward. Okay, there are books in the back, I appreciate yeah. it. Thank you, everyone. Thank you, Kara. Thank you, University of Chicago. Buy the book. Yeah. Thank you.